All right, I'm starting at the um, about a third of the way down on page eight. Violet read the next letter, December 1st, 1918. Dear Violet, how are you? The influenza is really bad here. I treated 85 patients in the tenements behind Hester Street yesterday. I start at the bottom of one building and work my way up, calling on patients. And then when I get to the roof, I step across onto the next building and work my way down. Don't worry, there's no space in between the buildings. I called on one family where the mother, father, and six children were all sick in one little room and all huddled into one bed. None of them spoke any English. So far, I haven't gotten the flu. Touch wood means like knock on wood because I'm careful to wear my mask all the time. Are you wearing yours? They also gave all of us public health nurses an inoculation, that means a shot, at the Henry Street Settlement House. But we think that it's a placebo, a fake shot to make us think we're protected. The other night I had a funny accident. I was coming home in the dark after seeing 107 patients and I crashed right into a young man carrying a shovel. We both went sprawling into the gutter, which was not exactly clean. I guess there are still more horses than motor cars in New York. It turned out the poor fellow had been digging graves, which is a pretty big job these days. It's related to the flu. Anyway, he was very polite and forgiving and walked me home. Please write and let me know how you're doing. I think about you all the time. Love, Chloe. That letter started stupid tears in Violet's eyes again, and she dashed them away from the sleeve of her midi blouse. She thought about Chloe all the time too. So that was what Chloe was doing, being a public health nurse. During the huge scene after Chloe bought the hope chest, Chloe had, shout, had shouted something about wanting to do something meaningful with her life. Mother had cried and asked her what wasn't meaningful about marrying an up and coming man like Mr. Russell or was it Mr. Rice, and having beautiful babies. Violet, listening on the stairs, had known just what Chloe meant. At school, Violet's class was knitting squares to make blankets for French war orphans. Miss Smedley read to the class. Ivanhoe was what she was reading to them just then, for half an hour each day while they knitted. And although Miss Smedley tried to make a game of it by keeping score of who knitted more squares, the boys or the girls, to Violet, Knitting those squares seemed like the most important thing she had ever done in her life. She felt as though she was part of something huge, something vital, something that involved the whole world, or at least much more of the world than she had ever seen. Mr. Rice, or was it Mr. Russell, had no very high opinion of women working or voting or doing anything interesting. Both Mr. R's worked for father at the bank and they still came to Sunday dinner every week, even though Chloe was no longer around for either of them to marry. Last Sunday, they tried to outdo each other making jokes about women voting. Can you imagine if women were actually allowed to vote? Mr. Russell had said. Elections would have to go on for days with all those women standing in the voting booths not being able to make up their minds. Not only that, but they'd be standing up on their little tippy toes, trying to peer into the other booths to see who the other women were voting for, said Mr. Rice. Violet couldn't imagine why mother and father had thought Chloe would ma marry either of the, one of them. She eagerly unfolded the next letter. December 20th, 1918. Dear Violet, Merry Christmas. I've been thinking about you a lot. I wish I could come see you for Christmas, but father would just slam the door in my face again. So it would be a waste of gasoline at more than 20 cents a gallon. Did I tell you the hope chest gets 25 miles to the gallon though? It's great. Are you starting to guess what the hope chest is? The influenza seems to be spreading a little less this week, touch wood. I hope you are still well. A friend of mine was very bad with it, but he's better now and I think he will live. It was scary though. The federal government has started deporting foreign-born radicals to Russia. Can you imagine? A lot of them didn't even come from Russia. Some of them have lived in this country nearly all their lives. But I guess that's what happens when you have a war. People start hating immigrants. I think there are people who just need someone to hate. I just hope they don't deport all of them. Some of them are such dear people. I hope you can come to New York City one day. You never saw a place so alive with so many different ideas being talked about in so many different languages. New York City is a college education in itself. 
Still, I hope that you at least will find a way to go to college, and I mean a whole four years of it. Love, Chloe. Violet put the letter down and looked out at the muddy waters of the Susquehanna slipping by. Chloe made what their mother had always called the wrong sort of people sound really interesting, which Violet had always suspected they might be. Wasn't it just like their parents to want to keep Violet away from anything interesting? Chloe was wrong about Violet finding a way to go to college, though. Violet didn't want to go to college. School was boring, and the sooner she was out of it, the better. Besides, father was against college for girls. The next thing in the pile wasn't a letter, but a slender, ten-framed snapshot. Stephen and Chloe, when they were teenagers, sat stiffly in their Sunday best and held baby Violet, who wore a white dress with enormous skirts that covered both their laps. She had been a plain baby, Violet thought, just like she was a plain girl, with straight brown hair that had never curled and never would, and a snub nose and ordinary brown eyes. Mother must have stuck the picture into the pile of letters, but why? So that she would remember what Chloe looked like? Or was she trying to hide Chloe so she could forget her? <laughs>